All right, all right. Welcome everybody to Trino Community Broadcast number 45. We're we're rounding up on that uh, 50 number here shortly. And uh, today we have a, a special set of guests uh, here. But first, I'll, before I uh, hop on to them, I will uh, first introduce my, uh, my partner in crime, Cole Bowden. Uh, how's it going, Cole? Hello, it's glad to be here. This is the first community broadcast I've been on in a little while. So happy yeah, to be I know. Where, 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 where were you, man? <laughs> were you like uh, ducking out or were you sick or what was going on? There was one where I had the flu. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know, it yeah. happens. It does happen. It's it's unfortunate, but it's that time of year where it's like, you know, you get with a bunch of sick people inside the, the doors all the time and it's cold and it's hot and it goes back and forth and yeah, everybody gets sick. So Never fun, but, uh, you know, uh, glad that you're feeling better now and uh, uh, here with us today. Um, so, yeah, this uh, this uh, go around, we're going to be actually talking with uh, a, a, um, a community that, uh, uh, you know, a whole separate community that is on the other side of the world of us. Uh, and we always really like these kind of global reach, uh, global reaches that we can do. So uh, we're talking today about workflow orchestration. A lot of people, uh, you know, when they think of workflow orchestration here in the United States, they're commonly thinking of Airflow. That's that's the kind of uh, you know incumbent system that a lot of people are using these days. But there is a lot of times where you know uh, there you know there's a lot of newer kind of uh, innovation that's needed. Sometimes there's there's other uh, kind of needs that that uh, are had, particularly around trying to um, kind of federate or make the ability to interact with these systems a lot more applicable to end users and, and bring the interaction uh, capabilities to people that are actually, you know, maybe using the data rather than defining uh, pieces on the data. And so, um, so we're going to get into this project called Apache Dolphin Scheduler. Uh, here today, we have uh, a whole bunch of uh, the, the folks from this project uh, joining us today from China. And uh, I'll start with you picking, picking on you, William. Uh, what time is it over there right now? Just so everybody has a feel for the de level of dedication you all have to joining us today. Yeah, now now I think it's a one a.m. <laughs> it's one a.m. <laughs> in Beijing. Okay, yeah. So so uh, you know we have me here in the in Chicago time. It's it's actually a pretty good hour for me. It's eleven a.m. Uh, Cole, uh, it's like a nine a.m. for you. Uh, one a.m. In, in Beijing time. So uh, and that's pretty much for everybody else here on the call. So William, uh, what what do you do uh, with in, in the project? Uh, are you how are you associated with Dolphin Scheduler? Yeah, actually, I am one of the PMC of Dolphin Scheduler, and I also is Apache Software Foundation member. Okay. And I used to work at uh, uh, Teradata, IBM, <laughs> Lenovo, and so on. I I worked for uh, in big data area for for over uh, uh, eighteen years. <laughs> awesome! Wow! Wow! Well, that's crazy! Yeah, I mean, I I I've been in. Uh, software for almost over just just hitting a decade so i'm only i'm, I'm like halfway where yeah but i started in big data so <laughs> that, that I've, I've i can almost say i have a, a decade of, of big data experience <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah yeah for sure <laughs> so um thanks for for joining us today uh next uh, I'll, I'll i'll pick on you david uh uh, what do you do in the Apache Dolphin Scheduler uh, project? Uh, hello, everyone. I'm David. I, I'm an Apache Dolphin Scheduler PMC chair. I'm uh, also an uh, Apache Incubator mentor. I mentor uh, some projects uh, like uh, Linkis, uh, Huge Graph, and uh, some other projects. Uh, I've been uh, working in Big Data uh, area for more than 10 years. Nice. Uh, I'm also an uh, open source project fan. I love open source culture very much. Yeah. I think I think you're in good you're in good company here, David. Uh, we we we're, we're all big fans of open source as well. And so um so yeah so I I, I think uh, um, that's a, a nice background list. You're the actual chair of of Dolphin Scheduler so you're the top right <laughs> 
you're, you're the, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, <laughs> um, okay. So going on to the next, uh, Nico Zhang, uh, you're the person that I interact with the most because you do a lot of the community things in Dolphin Scheduler. So what, what do you do? Uh, and, and, and give yourself a little introduction. Uh, okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Nico. I'm the advocate of the Apache Dolphin Scheduler community. It's been a pleasure to meet Brain. Uh, it's been an honor to be working with the channel community on this broadcast. I hope you have enjoyed. If you are interested in Dolphin Scheduler, please contact me on Slack. Okay, Amazing. thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Nico. Thanks for hanging out. Uh, and then uh, to finally, you know, last but not least, uh, Jay Chung, how, how are you doing? And what do you uh, do with Dolphin Scheduler as well? Jay, are you there? Jay's looking a little uh, frozen. frozen. Yeah, it <laughs> looks like looks like we may have <laughs> lost lost Jay. So hopefully we'll we'll get him back in a second. But all oh, Jay, are you there? Can you hear us? Sorry, my network is crash that time. Yeah. No, no worries. Yeah. I can hear you now. Uh, feel free to yeah, introduce yeah. yourself. Yeah. Hi, I'm Jay Chang, and I'm also the Apache Dolphin Scheduler PMC. I work for software engineer for almost six years. And I have five years in data engineer thing, yes. And also I love the open source project. I every day spend my many my my time in the PR review or the issue review. Yes. Awesome. And, yeah. Awesome. Great, Jay. And we're going to be hearing uh, a lot more from you later uh, during the demo. So excited to see the demo that you've pulled together with Dolphin Scheduler and Trino. So, yeah. okay. Well, without further ado, um, let's, uh, you know, go quickly into uh, I, we Manfred uh, last uh, two weeks ago, um, on the last uh, episode, or is it two weeks? And it's like three weeks ago. I don't know. We, we've, it's been actually almost a whole month now. Um, so about a month ago now, uh, Manfred did a recap of Trino in 2022. Um, I wanted to kind of hit some of these top level pieces before we get into the meat and potatoes of, of this, um, of this this week's um, or this uh, episode, and so um, so recap in 2022, uh, we have a a blog that we wrote um, that details uh, full feature, you know, all all of the things that have kind of happened. So you know, a lot of statistics and kind of high level things that have have gone on in the community over the last year. Um, some trending uh, moments that we had. So uh, we we went out with the leaving Facebook post uh, and uh, had a really good success with getting some awareness around the project with that. So, uh, you know, really kind of pushing uh, all of you folks that are on Hacker News to share anytime you find a post that we have that's interesting um, and all sorts of other things, including, you know, Trino touching the world. Um, you know, we, we wanted to kind of give a, a sense for you know, kind of our top users, and and uh, surprisingly, you know, not or maybe not surprisingly, uh, in third place uh, is is where China sits uh, with, you know, uh, thirty one thousand uh, users that that are visiting our site. Uh, this is these are site numbers and, and number of individual IP addresses mm -hmm. that that visit the uh, uh, Trino website. So this kind of gives a sense for the the size of the community in each of these locations. And so China is definitely one of the the powerhouses of of, of uh, Trino users. Uh, and so this is why. I think it's particularly exciting that uh, we are growing, um, you know, kind of the associations with different projects that are like like uh, Dolphin Scheduler that are very popular in, in uh, particularly in a China user base. Um, so so this is really exciting in the same way, like we want, you know, this, a similar kind of thing. There's some a good chunk of users that are using Dolphin Scheduler today in the U.S., but we want to we want to grow that on both ends. So this has become, you know, kind of a really exciting overlap of, of our two projects that we have here. So um, so definitely check out this um, this this uh, um, link here that kind of uh, brings you to the rabbit reflex uh, um, URL. And we'll talk about a lot of these features like merge supports that we added this year, uh, JSON functions. Uh, the polymorphic table functions uh actually cole you did a uh a, a trino community broadcast a while back 
now uh, on that. And, and so dive into a lot of details there. Um, obviously the big one fault tolerance execution. That was a, that was a quite a, I would say a, a pivot point, uh, kind of feature that, that really changes like the, a lot of the use cases that we can now support in Trino. And so, and, and many, many more. So, uh, so definitely if you, you know, are wanting to look at, um, uh, you know, what happened with Trino last year uh, and kind of get excited for all the things that came down. Uh, check out that blog. Um, one of the other things I want to quickly highlight, um, Trino Definitive Guide uh, is uh, came out with a second edition. And not only that, but um, second edition uh, in the Chinese translation uh, will be out uh, later this year. I think it's going to be probably June or July. Uh, and there will be a Chinese translation available that uh, anybody who's uh, watching here, we'll we'll try to basically make it available to anybody who's uh, uh, kind of learning about us through the Dolphin Scheduler thing. We'll we'll make that uh, Chinese edition available uh, shortly. Um, and then uh, one final point I wanted to make um, in the Trino here. Let me let me bring over my. Uh, um, so if you go to the Trino. Um, uh, Slack channel. If you join the Trino Slack channel, um, we have these these uh, different um, we have these different rooms or different channels, and particularly there's ones that begin with the tag general uh, that have a dash and a kind of language uh, pointer. So uh, this this is our general in uh, uh, room. Basically, anybody who wants to talk to uh, other Trino users that are, that speak the dialect of Japanese. Uh, we also have a, um, uh, let me see, I think, a, what is it, Korean one that we just opened up. And let me actually just go uh, open up. Let me see if I can join. What do I, I this recently just changed and, uh, <laughs> and let's see, there's create. I want to join <laughs> the, there's a manage, I want to see, browse channels. There we go. All right. So let me look for all the general channels. I believe we have Chinese, Japanese, Chinese, German, Japanese. and Korean. Are yep. Our so th those are our current ones. If there are, if if there's a kind of uh, community of users that speak a di whole different language, please let us know. Um, you know, if, uh, so currently there's Chinese, Japanese, uh, and I ha highly recommend anybody who's watching on this that wants to uh, join to hop onto the Chinese channel. We already have 103 members there, um, and then there's the German channel and Korean channel. So um, so we're, we're building these out on a demand basis based on like, what well, you know, anybody that wants to, but we just wanted to actually showcase that, uh, to make sure that, you know, if you want to, uh, kind of ask, uh, the, the users in this space that maybe speak the local dialect to make things easier for you, uh, th those are available for you as well. So, uh, so without further ado, before we, uh, hop into the content of, uh, of this uh, episode, let's, uh, quickly jump into the, uh, the release that just happened, uh, Cole, do you want to kind of give us some of the high-level features that, that came down the, the pipe in this release? Uh, yeah, so there were some relatively big changes. Um, the release took a little while because of a few different blockers that slowed it down, um, which means that we got a lot more changes in this release than we normally would. Um, yeah. This includes uh, several large performance improvements. Some for highly selective queries is the way Martine summarized it, which I appreciate uh, because you can see like small concurrent queries run on large clusters is the actual note uh, written. So performance improvements, um, tons of performance improvements from reading for Parquet across various connectors. Um, we added the query pass through function to the Cassandra connector. So you could now push down entire queries for Cassandra to run natively. Um, which was the topic of that polymorphic table function episode we did before. Mm -hmm. um, an unregistered table procedure in Delta Lake and Iceberg, uh, and also support for writing to the change data feed in Delta Lake. So it used to be that the CDF was only automated, but now in case there's something you want to modify or edit or adjust, you can go ahead and do that. Nice. Um, which is a pretty big deal, and there's been more improvements to that coming down the line in 408. I think that shift with a couple snags that are being addressed. So cool. stay tuned for that to be even better come next version. Um, in my opinion, definitely not because it was my PR. The most exciting change <laughs> was 
<laughs> that we added an action to Trino contributions, um, where when pull requests go stale, a bot now will comment. It'll ping me, it'll ping Brian, it'll ping Manfred, and the three of us will swoop in and try to get things rolling again. So, And I started doing that yesterday, actually. So we got tagged starting over the weekend, actually, because I think David merged it over the weekend. Oh, and... We got tagged on the, the Monday holiday. Is what it on was. the Monday holiday, yeah, yeah. yeah. It only it only tags us Monday to Friday. We don't get pink. Oh, good. Weekends, but it doesn't <laughs> so, know about President's Day. I didn't so there was a huge part. influx of, of of tags that we got on uh, on Monday, and we happened to be on holiday that day. But then I I went back and I just like I went through all the notifications yesterday and started reaching out, getting things moving. And we've actually already had like some some PRs merged. Uh, that were supposed to be merged, but we're just kind of like, oh, somebody missed something real fast, you know, or they thought that they were waiting on something, but they actually weren't. Then we had a couple that were like, hey, this actually got solved by, some, by something else. Let's close this out. So what, what we're what the holy grail of what we're trying to get with this uh, this whole like thing is we we actually did a lot of like backlog sweeping and cleared out a whole bunch of the really old and stale ones uh, and communicated with people directly about that. We didn't do it in an automatic way like you see a lot of projects do. We, we really actually like went ourselves one by one. Um, and then the, the next part is, uh, the next phase of this is to have like, you know, keeping this down from like, you know, the, the 500 to 600 we started with. Now it's kind of, oh, it's sorry, 700 PRs. Now we're down to like three 350. So we literally cut that in half. Um, we're trying to get to a point where basically what's left, well, ideally we'll be looking at somewhere around, you know, 200 to 250 of PRs that will actively be worked on at a time, uh, at least at our current state. And and basically, you know, anything that's kind of stuck or postponed or anything like that, those will get kind of, you know, closed temporarily. And then eventually over time, you know, you can reopen those whenever there's active work being done. And this just makes, you know, things a lot easier from the maintainer perspective of where, sh where should I be focusing my time and, and energy on right now? Uh, and that will actually improve the performance and how quickly we can get things out um, and rather than things kind of just sitting stale for a long time. <laughs> yeah, and so. so for a Trino end user, you know, the question is like, what's the big deal? And, yeah. you know, immediately there's not going to be a massive payoff, but in the long term, this will make Trino development a little faster, a little more efficient, a better experience, and I think it will improve Trino long term in subtle ways, but definite ways, so. Yeah, yeah, totally. I'm excited uh, about that. Quick, quick shout out uh, from from Manfred. Uh, he's he's uh, the third of our DevRel team, but he just wanted to say thanks to everyone on the Dolphin Scheduler team for for joining us so late at night. <laughs> so uh, again, thank you again. Um, okay, uh, let's continue, Cole. I, I I interrupted you with my whole soapbox about how excited I am about Stale. <laughs> it's a it's a good soap. I'm excited too, Brian. So yeah, I, I don't mind like. We could talk about that for an hour if we really wanted to. We're not yeah, done. yeah. Um, not. <laughs> next fix. Uh, there was a fix to Kerberos on the Kudu connector. Um, I looked at it when we got fixed. It, it was surprising to me that this had existed the way it had for a while, where the issue was Kerberos issues like authentication tickets. And then when those tickets expire, it should renew or move on to new tickets. And it wasn't. It would just hold on to the expired tickets and then error out because it wasn't authenticated or validated anymore. Um, so you couldn't run the Kudu connector for more than like 24 hours. And now you mm. can't. So you don't just need to restart Trino or like restart Kerberos every time you're running the Kudu connector for long running jobs. Like it can just go. Um, which is a massive usability improvement. Um, yeah. I'm not sure the Kudu connector is our most popular is probably the answer to my question of how this existed is yeah i was not, i was just about to say that actually. Not, not a ton of people who were going to run into that but like if that was why you weren't using it it's gone now so you can go yeah. ahead um and then finally i just there were a ton of sophisticated performance improvements we added like six new configuration values so that you can use to fine-tune um trino performance with like remote task split size and minimum task size default task size um which was fun to read like going over it to try to figure out how i wanted to document it because several engineers were discussing like okay like what are what are our arguments for setting these as defaults these as defaults like 
how does this perform on certain benchmarks? What's the yeah. deal? Is this worth it? Yeah. Um, and the answer is, well, yeah, they got there. But it also is just interesting to watch the process of how we make Trino go that much faster, squeeze that much more speed and performance out of this engine. So, yeah. Um, and we've said it a million times, like it's always these like these very small, ch small aggregate, like changes that aggregate into something much bigger. But like those small changes are things that like are very like, it feels minuscule, but it's something that we obsess over in terms of getting it right as we're going out on those. And yeah. it's you, just look at any of the things tagged in with performance or has performance in the title. And you'll, you'll see a long debate about how it's done. <laughs> and when you have one 1% change, you know, that's not going to revolutionize the user experience. Yeah. But when you do a 1% change every release, yeah, or a couple of them every release, 101% yeah. changes and suddenly you're twice as fast. So yeah, yep, exactly. Cool. Well, uh, anything else you wanted to cover on the release before we, we hop into the concept? I think that about covers it. So let's All get right. back to to the Don't concept the of the episode. All right. Well, um, so I, I think that what we really want to get to the heart of, I mean, before we dive into any specifics, like I think that uh, some most people are pretty familiar with workflow orchestration. Um, any anybody who is in kind of a big data background has has probably dealt with Uzi, uh, or if you're not even uh, you know from the the Hadoop era time, uh, maybe you're you're kind of uh, you've more recently played around with something like uh, Airflow, or uh, more recently there's been Daxter um, as these kind of like workflow orchestrators, um, and. You know the the basic thing that all of these technologies are are aiming to do um, is that we're we're ultimately trying to uh, kind of basically put these different tasks that happen across uh, data engineering in general into uh, somewhat of a unit that that gets executed and gives us the ability to to uh, reason about or essentially. Uh, you know, reason about how the execution of ordering. So, you know, if you think about this, this kind of like, in fact, we have a nice little uh, graph here. You know, there's there's these um, SQL operations that that happen, and so uh, there's a unit of of uh, execution that happens within the SQL process, and then it's done. Um, and then you have another SQL process here. This is like maybe the first one, the second one, and then you have the third one. You can then, when you, when you encompass all of the SQL that happens within each of those like uh, tasks, you can call them, um, or jobs. Some people, you know, depending on the the uh, orchestrator, will call them different things. Um, will then, you know, uh, encompass these things into small little things. So that's what these little uh, parallelograms are, are representing here in this diagram. And so now that we have these in smaller units, we're now able to actually represent something like the order of operation that needs to happen. So in this particular uh, directed acyclic graph or DAG, which is a very popular term amongst workflow orchestrators, um, you can run this first SQL uh, task and then run the second SQL task at the same time. They, they are mutually exclusive. They can run independently. Um, but this third task here actually needs to is, is dependent upon these first two tasks completing. So this task now in this particular uh, DAG um, needs to wait until both SQL Query One and SQL Query Two are executed. So giving having a workflow orchestrator uh, gives us this ability to like instead of having to like manually run things or run a script that does you know, some sort of weird check to make sure that, oh, SQL 1 is done, or you have to do some more of all these special things. Like This, this is all actually something that gets managed by a, a uh, workflow orchestrator. It, it basically has this, this, uh, these abstractions called tasks so that you can kind of model the, the order of, of operation and the order of execution uh, for all of these different tasks. So that's that's at its core how I kind of see workflow orchestration. And these tasks don't have to be SQL. They're very much commonly SQL in a context of Trino, but these can be things like uh, you know, bash 
uh, scripts, or these could be Python scripts, or these could be, you know, interfacing with uh, spinning up some Kubernetes cluster. These could be a lot of different things, depending on what the workflow orchestrator is capable of, of handling. Um, and so in the context of Trino, you know, if we just think about just what Trino is doing and what, what task we need to uh, essentially orchestrate, um, it's generally going to be thought of, you know, SQL, but then you could also think of like the upstream or downstream changes of like, you know, fi prepping the files, making sure there's schemas available and things like that. So, um, so that's kind of my take on, on workflow orchestration. Um, I'll, I'll kind of open this, you know, maybe, maybe I didn't uh, cover everything, but like, how would, uh, William, how would you uh, summarize workflow orchestration? Uh, I'll pick on you first and, and kind of, you know, What's what's the whole what's the goal here? If you, if you were to summarize, yeah, yeah, I, I think your explanation is very good, <laughs> and uh, I think uh, uh, besides the job uh, job workflow orchestration uh, feature, there is another important feature for workflow orchestration nowadays. Uh, I think the feature is called to orchestrate the resource. For example, you know. Mm, uh, you know, there will be a lot of SQL queries uh, to to database, for example, Trino DB. Mm -hmm. And uh, there will be a lot of uh, SQL jobs at the same time. And actually, the concurrency uh, will not be, to be for example, 1,000 or 2,000. Perhaps you, you, only, uh, you only have a, uh, the concurrency of the Trino DB only, for example, 100 or only 10 or, or, or 20. So mm -hmm. how to control the concurrency uh, mm -hmm. on your lot of uh, SQL jobs? That's uh, one feature, the import feature for the orchestration tools. That means you can control, uh, you can uh, create, we call the a connection pool, something like mm -hmm. that. And okay. you can set the connection pool, for example, only uh, 50 queries can enter into the uh, Trino DB. And when the SQL job is uh, over than 50 jobs, and then we will order by the priority of the SQL tasks, because uh, every task in Oxygen tools, we will give them a, a priority. Then you gotcha. can control the whole workflow uh, uh, to run in a, uh, a, 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 a better a better environment. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So that's another feature, I think. <laughs> so this could, yeah, this kind of gets into you know you, you mentioned priority, and so I remember a lot in the Uzi days, we actually had like pri different priority queues, and mm -hmm. if uh, let's say you had. Um, let's say there was like a user priority queue or maybe something that faced end users, you would want mm -hmm. those to have all of the compute. And then maybe there were batch project, batch operations that were not human facing that would, mm -hmm. you know, kind of take, could, could take longer and, and be delayed. So um, mm -hmm. this is, you're essentially adding an abstraction that um, enables you to uh, not only kind of, uh, be cognizant of what resources are available or not available, but then mm -hmm. who gets those resources, um, what what either groups of people or individual users uh, are able to, like, let's say, get priority or special treatment, and which ones need to wait. Uh, and prim primarily, you know, you'll, you'll try to prioritize when a human's waiting for a query rather than, you know, if, if there's a kind of automated task that uh, can run whenever nobody's running anything, those will get lower priority and get bumped in the back of the line um, when, when, when needed, right? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. So, I mean, and that's, and, and I think it goes even further than that, right? There was another one that I thought of as you were kind of explaining that possibly you know there's there's these also being able to when you have these things split out into different tasks and just, and split out into all of these different uh you know you can you could start monitoring and actually get a better sense of the state of of what's going on in your in your system and i think this also gets very much into an important aspect of 
knowing, you know, when you're at a high threshold uh, and when you're getting too close to having these problems, right? Um, being able to detect and, and try to, in advance, increase those resources and increase that availability to to anybody who's who's watching this thing. I think that's yet another kind of uh, element that workflow orchestrators are incorporating more and more nowadays to make it uh, a, a, a much less stressful uh thing that you know engineers have to carry on them like thinking oh my gosh all of this things could happen well if you set enough kind of monitoring and orchestration and, and, and or sorry not orchestration um alerting in place and things like that you'll you'll be able to kind of sleep soundly knowing that okay this this system's going to tell me when something's even like close to that or at least give me some warnings and so i'll be able to like uh avoid any kind of like high, you know, peak or, or, or that that kind of hits us all of a sudden. Uh, hopefully, I'll be able to kind of pre-detect when this is going to happen, and I'll I'll have data collected from previous you know months and years of when our peak times are going to be, so that I can prepare and kind of uh, you know counter any initial um, uh, blast of 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 uh, traction uh, traffic that we'll have. Is that? Also, kind of another area that that work orchestrators are really kind of starting to improve. Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. <laughs> yeah, great. So this gets into another question. Then, so we, you know, one of the core use cases that when you think about, uh, you know, needing an orchestrator um, is is kind of, you know, a lot of people think about it from the the data uh, warehousing perspective. Um, Trino kind of doesn't necessarily, you know, Trino connects to data warehouses. Um, we, we have a Redshift connector. We have all of these uh, different, um, uh, like let's, uh, Redshift, uh, there's a Snowflake one coming down the line. And then we also have, um, uh, what am I, uh, Teradata as well. And a couple other um, that I'm just not like spacing on right now. But you think about workflow orchestration from like, you know, Hadoop days, all the way, uh, you know, to, to even just before that, you're thinking generally of like a warehouse, right? A kind of like a, a warehouse flow where you're trying to stage multiple pieces and bring them into one location. But nowadays, uh, that that location kind of is shifting between, you know, just putting everything into a warehouse, but the the central kind of copy that people uh, have from a cost perspective tends to be in a data lake. Um, does workflow orchestrators also kind of like uh, fit in the same model that they were for for um, for our warehouses as they do for uh, for for data lakes these days? Yep. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll still pick on you, William, if you want, or if anybody else has any thoughts on that. If do where where do workflow orchestrators fit for for data lakes? Uh, uh, let, let me answer the question first, <laughs> and yeah, I sure. can answer you if you have other ideas. And actually, I think uh, somehow Data Lake is more like uh, um, more powerful uh, data warehouse because mm. you have to extract data from uh, different data sources, for example, from uh, uh, Workday or Salesforce or something like that. And uh, also, you will have a lot of uh, detailed jobs in your data lake. So uh, in my point of view, uh, there will be a more than, there will be more and more uh, uh, SQL or other tasks in, 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 your, uh, uh, in your data lake. So uh, if you want to handle the, the whole uh, 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 ETL things, uh, in, in to run in the in the right order, you have to 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 build uh, something workflow orchestration tools, mm -hmm. and uh, I think so. I think uh, in data lake or in some uh, we call a real time data warehouse, you also mm -hmm. need uh, workflow orchestration. You know, yeah. there's not only uh, now the nowadays uh, workflow orchestration tools not only support. A batch job, but they also support uh, streaming job. For for example, Spark streaming or Flink streaming, yeah. and you know, from streaming, uh, from one streaming job to the other streaming job, perhaps one streaming job uh, uh, just uh, uh, load the data to Kafka, and the mm -hmm. other extract data from Kafka. 
So yeah. they also have some uh, dependencies, but they are not triggered by um, uh, triggered by the the job ends. But they they they, they also have a DAG uh, 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 task in order because the, the the data will first to the will f first go to the uh, first uh, Flink job and then the other Flink job. So I think the, that, that's Which, why I think uh, we, we need a, <laughs> a workflow of certain tools. Would you say it's actually more important in a data lake? Because essentially data lake has a lot more uh, disaggregated technologies that kind of are interopping on the data lake. And so mm -hmm. because you have more variants of tasks, you end up needing actually a workflow orchestrator that can handle a wide, much wider variety of not just SQL, right? It's not always going to be SQL. Yeah. It's going to be so many different potential things that need to uh, keep that data lake alive and breathing. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah yes, yes. Okay, so, so it's actually and, not just what we do. with technology are used, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it's getting more complicated, right? The whole the whole data landscape uh, has adding more options, which gives you a lot more flexibility uh, in terms of how you do things. You know, there's a lot more, uh, but but you know, so it's 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 definitely harder these days to kind of have to know what to choose. But you know, you like if you think about it like a Lego set, I think about it like this mm -hmm. a lot of times. You know. Uh, mm -hmm. the data scene back in the eighties was like a very small amount of Legos. You just had, you know, the four block and then like an eight block and you just built mm -hmm. those on top of each other. Now we have mm -hmm. like all sorts of new, new shapes of, of yeah. Legos that we have. And you have all this uh, opportunity to build it in so many different ways. The, the, uh, problem is that, you know, once you have all these things and let's say you want to build it in all these certain ways, making things work like they're one unit is kind of the part that the, the workflow orchestrator is now starting to take responsibility for um, and trying to make it like a, like a, a single uh, stack that, that runs seamlessly together, You're essentially being the glue that, that, you know, gets all of these different Lego pieces uh, together. You're the, you're the stickiness that, that pieces these things and makes them happen and, 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 and work uh, in a, consistent way together right is that making is that yeah. like uh going with what what you thinking of it yeah yeah and and, and actually um, more and more developers just to uh, uh, develop their i uh, think uh, their jobs on data lake not only yeah. sql but also java python yep. erlang or go or something or spark or something like that so you have to head of them all in one place so that's uh off the trader <laughs> got it yeah. well let's you know so we we've we've talked about what workflow orchestrators are in a kind of more generic sense let's let, I'm, let's hop right into dolphin scheduler um david since you're the chair of apache dolphin scheduler yeah. and somebody's going to come up to you on the street and ask you hey what is it that you're you're working on you uh and and what are what are you all doing with dolphin scheduler how do you explain uh, that to, that to them if uh, in a couple sentences. Yeah, Dolphin Scheduler uh, is a modern um, modern data workflow orchestration tool. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, what uh, it's uh, what is uh, different from other orchestration tools is um, because the, we provide uh, a powerful user interface. Uh, we dedicated to solving complex uh, dependencies in the data pipeline, and uh, we provide them many, many, many types of tasks, uh, such as uh, Spark and Flink, uh, Python share. Uh, um, uh, we provide the many uh, data source, um, uh, such as uh, Trino, um, Presto, or uh, other uh, other data source. So we, we wanted to make uh, uh, we wanted to make uh, every uh, every type of jobs available out of the box. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, what? So this feature? isn't. Uh, can I ask you a quick question? So okay. so when you say out of out of the box, uh, you know, like and all all of these tasks are you know these aren't just tasks that are. You know, if you think about like Uzi, for instance, Uzi was very much like only handling uh, jobs that were hand happening on HDFS. 
you're you're talking about tasks that could be literally like a, a shell command uh or it could be uh i i've seen a couple on your website actually that like that interface with kubernetes or terraform and these types of uh tools that do you know ci cd scaffolding and things like that so this is much bigger than just like big data orchestrator this is dealing with yeah. a much more generic sense of of uh types of tasks that you can handle is is that correct yeah yeah correct okay. yeah yeah that's great yeah and actually yeah. Uh, what we want is create a, um, a, 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 a development, a, a developing platform for the big data developers. And they just can um, uh, edit their SQL or Shell or Python or Kubernetes uh, or Spark, uh, any, co any big data code on Apache Dolphin Scheduler. And okay. then they can arrange them uh, uh, into the DAG uh, job, and uh, then they can run in, in the DAG, in the, uh, then, then the workflow orchestration will, will do the uh, other things. So okay. that's what we want, is to let people uh, e uh, develop big data program easily. <laughs> yeah, 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 it makes a lot of sense. I, 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 one thing that really sticks out to me is this last line, the powerful DAG visual interface. So I know we've had visual interfaces, but particularly, you know, so, so even Airflow has like a visual interface, but you mm -hmm. all are particularly focusing on this drag and drop first notion. Could you dive into why that's so important and what, what use cases you want to enable on drag and drop? Yeah, um, actually uh, it's a very, uh, 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 it's a very, very interesting because uh, uh, the I think the main user of a Dolphin Scheduler at first is the data analyst. Mm -hmm. It's not a data engineer, you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, uh, there's uh, many, many data analysts. They just know SQL and they are no, for example, they, they can write SQL uh, on TrinoDB or they can write SQL on Spark SQL or Hive or something like that, but they cannot let that SQL run every day in, mm -hmm. uh, in some order. So what they need is to 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 some to is to uh, to, to to want some tools to to just they can use to create a all uh, workflow with no code. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the, yeah. First version of Dolphin Scheduler is is to just you can drag and drop, and then you can write a SQL or Python or something or shell uh, in in uh, in in the uh, I think it's a text box, and then uh, you can create the the job and the trigger and dependency just a drag from one task to the other, and mm -hmm. then the whole workflow will run. So gotcha. that's why <laughs> that's why Dolphin Scheduler is quite different from Airflow or Uzi or Azkaban. Gotcha. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> so so the the goal the the goal kind of the philosophy I should I should say like the kind of core philosophy mm -hmm. is that you're you're still trying to provide the similar APIs that that pre preceding um, the 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 preceding. Um, uh, or orchestrators have done in the past so that engineers still have their same tools, yeah. but you, you want to take off some of their responsibilities by offering yet another low code or no code type solution that yeah. enables them to basically just interact with, Hey, I, I have this, this, uh, function that let's say a data engineer even wrote and they can reuse mm -hmm. this same script or this same, you know, kind of modular piece that is very specific to my my uh you know don't my my organization or my team and i'm going to reuse this 
uh, multiple times. So the data engineer's job starts at, you know, defining that, writing the code yeah. initially, but then after that's been defined and tested well, mm -hmm. right, then you can reuse that as kind of this, this piece that, that uh, is, is now what an analyst or a BI engineer or any, any mm -hmm. person that's, you know, kind of wanting to facilitate and make the data uh, workflow happen, they can now define that uh, once those initial uh, kind of building blocks are created and they essentially build that build that uh, workflow themselves and can manage it and do all of the visualizations that they'll be able to do through the through the UI. Is that kind of the philosophy and the core uh, driver for uh, Dolphin Scheduler? Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, and actually, we want more and more people to use big data tools, not only engineer, but yeah. also data analysts and other people who can can use uh, uh, can use big data uh, 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 quickly. I think, <laughs> or more yeah. efficiently. <laughs> yeah, I, t I totally think so. I totally agree with that. I think I think that is partially what where. Um, this whole concept of data mesh. Um, I'm not sure how mm -hmm. popular this is in China, but uh, here mm -hmm. in the States, uh, and uh, we, we've been really diving in on this concept, uh, popularized starting from the thought, thought, uh, is it thought, no, not thought spot. I almost said thought spot, thought works, um, which mm -hmm. uh, was popularized by uh, Jamak Degani. Um, it's this mm -hmm. kind of idea of, of uh, data mesh. So, a uh, self-service kind of, of layer that um, brings back to not just necessarily even analysts, but you, you think about software engineers that are working in a particular domain of your company. Mm -hmm. uh, they're providing mm -hmm. some sort of uh, services around the project, you know, and all the way from the web interaction that you get with the, the customer, all the way down mm -hmm. to, you know, the backend services that they're doing. And then, mm -hmm. you know, what we had traditionally done is centralized everything to, uh, to, to, you know, some data team, but now mm -hmm. data mesh is a way that we're trying to actually split that out and bring back, uh, some of the responsibilities back up to the software engineers, the data analysts again, and mm -hmm. doing a workflow orchestrator in this way, I think is a very kind of complementary story where you're giving mm -hmm. that, that capability back to uh, end users and giving more self-service capabilities so that they're also able to kind of have a, a say at the table of how, how this data gets set up. And it's not getting rid of data engineers by any means. It's just re nope. it's, it's kind of taking off some of those, yep. like, like uh, those, those overlapping tasks that data engineers literally had uh, for, for literally I maybe 15 years now where they have mm -hmm. been, you know, constantly centralized and having to take all of these requests from all these different end users and do it for everybody. Right. And so therefore nobody was getting their work done. Um, this is a, a way of, of optimizing that, that workflow and giving everybody else that responsibility back uh, and that autonomy essentially. Yeah, so yeah. very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Um, great. Well, um, is there, do, do you want, is, I, I, uh, before we hop on to kind of, uh, you know, more details about the, how Dolphin Scheduler works, is there anything in terms of the definition or what Dolphin Scheduler is that you want to cover that we may have missed? Hmm. So I think the, in, in one sentence, uh, Dolphin Scheduler is, um, uh, it's a distributed and uh, mm. uh, workflow, orchestration um, tools with powerful DAG re realization interface. We will right. just talk about the DAG uh, interface. Yeah. Uh, but actually, Dolphin Scheduler is an, ha has another feature. Uh, we call it the high uh, availability and a high performance uh, because okay. we just design with the architect with uh, multi uh, mastering and multi workers. So uh, the performance is very well, and uh, it can just uh, support. I, I, I heard some users uh, use Dolphin Scheduler uh, to support more than two million tasks in one day. And mm. uh, typical users are more than one million tasks in one day. So the performance is, is really good. <laughs> mm. So okay. I think it's, 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 uh, it's, um, it's another a feature of the Dolphin Scheduler. 
<laughs> yeah. You know, and, and, oh, what ahead. thing I think I think we forgot to ask about Dolphin Scheduler? What's is, that? Why is it called Dolphin? Who named it? Oh yeah, yeah. No, that's actually okay. a good <laughs> yeah, it's 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 um, uh, you know, uh, we love Dolphin very much, and uh, you know, Dolphin have a two brands. You know, the left brand and the, the right brand, and. Uh, just like uh, Apache Dolphin Scheduler is uh, have many worker and many masters. So, so uh, Dolphin didn't sleep, right? Yeah. And he does swim all the time. Sometimes the left uh, left brain are, 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 uh, is sleeping and sometimes the right uh, uh, brain is sleeping. So uh, Apache Dolphin Scheduler is something just like a Dolphin because it's very smart. And it never sleep because it has many muscles. Wow! And- I <laughs> I really <laughs> appreciate that. I really appreciate that that analogy. Uh, and dolphins are cute, right? <laughs> like, yeah, that's yeah. A, another good good aspect of it. But now that you bring in the that I I actually did not know that about dolphins, and that that is a really great analogy. We we actually lo- love animal analogies here. In fact, we've started to name a lot of our projects uh, after different animals like uh we have the tardigrade which were these like microscopic creatures that you know never actually never die they they regenerate and can and can basically come back from the dead um and so that was like our our task that would die you know it would basically regenerate and come back um there's also you know hummingbird it's our another project that where the hummingbird is these really fast and very mm-hmm. quick and and flexible and adaptable which is now our next query uh, uh optimization techniques so I think like, you know, the animal uh, parallels and amazing things that we see in nature, modeling those after things that we we're trying to do kind of in, in uh, 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 big data and, and data uh, workflows and systems, it's, it's always really fun to make those analogies. So um, anyways, so uh, I, that's, a, that's kind of an aside thing, but very cool. I like that uh, a lot, that, uh, that uh, analogy now. Um, so high availability, I think that's not anything that's too foreign for anybody that's, uh, you know, working with big data. Um, you know, even we have, uh, we don't have actually high availability with our coordinator or anything like that. Uh, but we do have uh, now, especially with fault tolerance capabilities, uh, abilities to kind of uh, support some of these fault tolerance capabilities from that. And then for the high availability from like a, a avail- an actual availability perspective, you know, there's all these other things that we we've done in the community to kind of uh, make that available. So I don't think that that's a foreign concept. It's a very much like thing that we've come to expect on the big data side. So it's great to know that Dolphin Scheduler also uh, uh, follows in that. And there's there's a, a bit of a thing that we're going to cover in a little bit, which is this monitoring metrics uh, stuff down down further, um, and as well as the uh, kind of re- resource dependency pieces that you were talking about before. So we'll, we'll hop into those uh, down, downstream. Um, but I really do like this kind of uh, picture that conceptualizes these these big differences of, of you know, um, again, high availability is a huge one. Plugin based is saying, you know, we, we cover not just the things that, you know, older ones used to cover, we cover a lot more. And drag and drop first, I think, are the big differentiators. And then this uh, workflow platform is going to be, you know, I think more standard of what people come to expect with other uh, other workflow things. But it's it's going to be interesting to see the ways in which you've you've kind of made your platform fit into this user centric uh, kind of kind of design. So um, so yeah, so I think that was a really good overview. Thanks thanks a lot for kind of filling us in there. Um, we we have a so let's before we hop on to the next thing. Uh, hello, Ashish Sign. Uh, thanks for for joining the broadcast today. Uh, nice seeing you here. And then we have a question uh, from Mateus. Um, so, uh, and I don't know if that's actually your whole first name. Maybe I should say Mateus Dos Anjos. Um, what are the main advantages of using Dolphin Scheduler versus Airflow and or DBT? Um, Mateus, we're we're going to. Uh, in fact, actually, I think that that's down here. Um, let's quickly get to this first question of. Uh, does Dolphin Scheduler have a computing engine or a storage layer? Um, because I think that's going to be some something that I'm, uh, you know, certain orchestrate orchestrators have these uh, capabilities sometimes that you can even offload some of the compute 
onto the orchestrator itself. So I'm just kind of curious to know, um, you know, what 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 is underneath this, the hood of Dolphin Scheduler? Does it have a computing engine? Engine? Does it store data, uh, or what does it store? Uh, yeah, I, I I want to share this first. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Take it, Jay. Yeah. Uh, just like the channel do not own the data, Dolphin mm -hmm. Scheduler also do not own the data too. It's just okay. the workflow oscillator, and the responsibility of the Dolphin Scheduler is just trigger and run the workflow. Yeah. Okay. It, it must make sure the workflow and the task run on the time as the user set or the, as a developer set. And okay. the the second thing I want the Dolphin Scheduler responsibility is it must to run the test only if the all the condition are met. So mm. we, we cannot run the single or the the, the uh, standalone task unless the upstream tasks are all done. And I think the workflow oscillator is also uh the important thing is the tolerance. It means we have the retries and the alert mechanism to tell you so when they get wrong so uh you know sometimes the schedule even do not calculate the calculate the task in their own it will send the request to the com computer or the a database like channel and tell channel to calculate in the data yeah okay oh okay yeah, yeah. So that makes sense. I, I think so. Basically, you're saying that there is no storage layer, just like Trino, but yeah. it does have a, a very advanced uh, computing engine that kind of makes a lot of these these kind of decisions and uh, for, for running the orchestration. So it's mostly all things in flow and, and in memory uh, uh, kind of uh, state stateful management. Is that? Yeah, is that... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, and so getting back to Mateus's question here, uh, I didn't want to keep him waiting for too long. So, you know, if we, if we look at airflow and DBT, I, so I'll just put in my little spin on like where I see DBT, I, DBT, uh, to me is like, uh, a, um, a SQL and now Python template, uh, uh, manager, manager that also can kind of, um, can, can kind of, uh abstract different uh you know pieces into like kind of these task type things um but but dbt has a very specific goal in that you're you're trying to test and va validate transformations um and that is it and that is like so so i think that like and, and when i say that is it that is a huge piece of like making sure that the data quality is correct and all of these other things. But DBT is not really trying to make sure that, uh, you know, more general things are happening, like, you know, uh, things that are happening in system A then go on, uh, happen uh, first, and then system B uh, kicks in right after system A is done doing its processing, and then system B and, C, B and D, you know, uh, will take over once system B is like doing doing all of that stuff and, and looking at the larger scope is not what DBT is trying to do. DBT is very niched in and focused in on like how do we make sure that like this change of data, this this transformation that happened uh, is uh, you know happened and is correct and we we have it tested, we have it documented, and we essentially uh, make this kind of essentially it's making those transformations much more atomic. Um, and and so that is a very tangent, not tangential, but it's like it's very, I would say, different from the goals that Airflow and Dolphin Scheduler. So moving DBT kind of off of, of, of its kind of in its own uh, camp, I wouldn't say that it's a um, kind of it's a apples and oranges more comparison. So Airflow, though, I think is a much closer one. And I'll, I'll give this one to uh, any of you. I, I know you all answer this question a lot more uh, exclusively on yours. So, you know, most people these days when they're working a, on a uh, air, air, or, uh, air workflow orchestration are using at Apache Airflow, I would say. But 
there's there's always trade-offs when it comes to all of these systems. And so we we covered, I think, one of the biggest ones with with um, Dolphin Scheduler, which is uh, I would I would kind of summarize as a user centric approach. Um, but, but there's, there's probably more to it and I want to dive, dive right now into that. So, um, anybody want to kind of talk about, you know, where, where the big value add, uh, and it can also include what I just said, the whole, uh, user centric user centricity. <laughs> um, but, uh, wh why don't you all kind of walk, walk us through, you know, if you're on Apache Airflow, what is the motivation for looking into Dolphin Scheduler? I... I think the most uh, important point of the uh, workflow orchestration tool is the stability. Uh, but as far as I know, uh, most of the workflow uh, orchestration um, tools uh, don't perform well uh, when the tasks are executed uh, uh, concurrently. Uh, mm. That's why we reinvented uh, the uh, view after using Uzi and uh, Airflow. Uh, we use the uh, decentralized the multi uh, work mass, mass, multi masters and uh, multi workers. We didn't have um, we didn't have uh, no um, no single um, no no single bottleneck point, no single point of failure. Okay. So uh, so um, the first uh, um, the first one. Um, uh, Dolphin scheduler private a uh, uh, high performance than uh, than Airflow. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, we uh, uh, the Dolphin scheduler is uh, two times faster uh, than Airflow uh, in some tags. And the second uh, uh, point uh, I think is um, easy to use. Uh, I think. Um, our product tools should be very simple and very easy to use. Uh, that's why we uh, we call the um, Dolphin scheduler uh, before we uh, end, uh, before I enter into the Apache incubator. We call the uh, easy scheduler. Uh, we uh, we wanted to make the uh, our solution to the more uh, more easy uh, for uh, new users. Uh, Usually, uh, uh, this is a barrier for new year, uh, for new users. Uh, the last point is the secure uh, ability. Uh, we have made a very good uh, secure ability. Uh, I think uh, we uh, integrated with uh, uh, TrinoDB uh, very well. We mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we refer the uh, SP, uh, SPI machine term from uh, TrinoDB. So nice. uh, we can integrate with many data data source. Uh, uh, for now, we have uh, we have supported more than uh, twenty tasks, uh, such uh, such as the shell, Python, and uh, Oracle data source. Uh, we and uh, uh, and the user can uh, and the user also can um, easily uh, to expand their tasks by themselves. Uh, we provide uh, um, uh, we provide the um, um, plugins um, API, so they can very easily to uh, to use to expand their new tasks very easily so so um so the 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 takeaways that i've i've i'm hearing is user like that still with that user centricity right trying to very much uh make it uh bring, bringing more people into actually using this uh performance is definitely a, uh, an element now one of those things about like just you know, talking about performance or showcasing a benchmark, you know, there's always cases uh, used like case by case basis. That the the thing I always recommend people, even when I'm talking about Trino performance versus say Spark performance or something, you always just need to try it when it comes to performance. Um, a lot of people want to see benchmarks, and 
you could the the bad part about benchmarks is you can always flex a benchmark to to basically do whatever you needed to do. Um, what's best to do for anybody who's actually curious about performance for their workloads is to actually try it out. And so um, so that's that's always one of those things. But I you know it sounds like the way that you're you're trying to tackle this this performance issue is really by uh, taking it from a scalability and and kind of uh, an almost MPP type type uh, method that we even use on the um, you know trying to basically make it as parallelizable as possible as well as uh, uh, fault tolerant right so um, so that's that's something that uh, I mean we we've done in Trino community that's that's worked well so I am very interested to see you know how the Trino community as they start to adopt this uh, you know and start to tr to trial uh, Dolphin scheduler um, how how um, how successful that they they are and 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 what performance they are seeing. That's always like a really good indicator to hear from the uh, the community. Um, one other thing that I'd like to point out uh, that I noticed uh, was when I look when you go to the um, Apache Dolphin Scheduler uh, uh, GitHub, you can go see just you know how how um, uh, the the uh, where the stars are. They're just about short of of ten thousand. Uh, uh, stars on GitHub, and I know that's a, a, a somewhat of a vanity metric, but it is always really good to kind of uh, see to what level people are focusing or, or, or tracking. And this is actually, you know, currently above where where even Trino uh, GitHub stars are. So it is a very popular project, um, to say the least. And uh, when did uh, Dolphin Scheduler actually um, uh, kind of like what's the first commit here on Dolphin Scheduler? If we let me see if we can, uh, if I can even go back to that, or if you have a tag that does that. What's what was the very first release? If we have any of that, let's see what the one, one point oh, two thousand nineteen. So you all have been around, maybe, and maybe this there was a, a slightly earlier commit than this, but the earliest version that you have posted out here is like two thousand nineteen. So uh, that that's uh, where we at today. We're, we're getting we're pretty close to this March. March value. So we're about four, you're about four years in and you're at 9.8 K stars. So that's a, that's a really good uh, trajectory and growth model. So that's, there's a lot to be said about, there are people that are very interested in this. There's a large community. Um, I imagine it is largely, you know, do, do you, would you say a good chunk of it is in China or is it pretty distri well distributed across the internationally? Actually, um, Many users are in Asia, for example, China, Singapore, okay. uh, Japan, and uh, something like that. And some users are, are in Europe, uh, UK, yeah. and uh, Germany. And uh, now we just have a very small user in the United States. <laughs> so yeah. that's we we just, yeah. uh, want more people to know Dolphin Scheduler. <laughs> but I feel like that's that's interesting, right? It's interesting from a, a U.S. perspective that this hasn't taken off probably because there just hasn't been uh, a marketing effort yet in the United States, and this is you all starting it now. And so that's why I think it's always interesting to, to check out uh, – you know, kind of projects that traditionally haven't been uh, pushed into a particular area, particularly the U the U.S. in this case, and but have had success in in many other uh, kind of geographical regions and, and countries in those regions, because um, it sounds like you all are 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 well on your way to get to gaining a lot of adoption across particularly Asia Pacific, but then even uh, a, a couple other uh, areas outside of that. So, you know, for those of us that are in the U.S. that have only been hearing about Airflow and Daxter and uh, mm -hmm. and, and uh, maybe even Prefect, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's that's been the primary three that we've been kind of uh, uh, getting put in, in front of us. But now I think like having um, you know, so so you're like, what's what's the other one? Why should I look into this? Well, if you look at the success that Dolphin Schedulers had in other um, in other communities outside of the U.S., uh, it's kind of very telling mm -hmm. that this is a an exciting system, uh, and and it's, it's something interesting to to take a look at. So, 
uh, I really hope to see that, you know, as, as kind of people start using it, um, you know, that it'll be a good uh, indication very quickly, you know, what, what people in the U S actually are, are looking for and maybe some uh, more of the uh, understandings around this. So um, what's really exciting today is that if you do want to play around with it and just get your feet wet, uh, the demo that we have today was added to our getting started repository um, by Jay here. So uh, we're going to cover that in a second, but, you know, getting back to Mateus's question about, you know, airflow versus this, um, it sounds like the, if, if you're wanting to get your uh, users a little more involved and take some of the pressure off of your, your data engineering team, that's a very good motivation. Um, also that, you know, uh, Dolphin Scheduler really has this uh, performance in mind. And so uh, whether that will specific, what that will translate to specifically to your workload will, will of course always depend. But uh, what, what I think is, is really good to kind of like uh, try to jump in and, and figure out, you know, is, is the performance good for us? Um, obviously, the user uh, 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 applicability and low code kind of capabilities are, are very much there. And I think that's something that's interesting enough to me uh, to kind of make a more self-service platform, especially if that's what you're going for. Um, and it's becoming much more popular of, an, of a notion in, in the U.S. as well. So, so that, that gets me really excited about Dolphin Scheduler myself. Um, and all the, all the things that you mentioned too, David, like are very, very great, uh, you know, kind of the engineering rigor that goes into building these, these systems out uh, is, is nothing to be overlooked. Um, great. A anything that I missed um, and kind of at, piling on there? No, uh, I, I can give you an example and uh, for um, for who will use Dolphin Scheduler instead of Airflow. <laughs> mm -hmm. Actually, uh, I use uh, I, I use Airflow before, uh, and uh, I have uh, more than 30,000 uh, uh, 30, tasks, and I found that uh, if at that time, uh, I, when I was using Airflow, I, I, I found that it, the performance is not very good. Exactly, mm -hmm. it's actually more than I think two twenty twenty thousand tasks. Mm -hmm. So I have to divide my Airflow uh, cluster into many small Airflow clusters. Mm -hmm. So I have uh, more than uh, uh, ten instance of Airflow. So yeah. that means I have to divide a whole picture of a DAG into many pieces. So, uh, at that time, I, I didn't know Dolphin Scheduler. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then I found that Dolphin Scheduler can support very good, uh, many, many, uh, can support a, a huge numbers of tasks. Yeah. So that's why we just uh, migrate Airflow to, to Dolphin Scheduler. So yeah. I think if uh, if the user's uh, task is more than one uh, ten thousand tasks, I think you you can try Apache Dolphin Scheduler because Great. it's more easily to to handle the, all the things. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah, and so it's not even just this this user capability or the uh, the you know the kind of just performance on each individual task. You're saying that yeah. it's the aggregation and and starting to kind of scale up. Especially the fact that it sounds like Dolphin Scheduler is really trying to push the limits of what gets supported. So as you support more more types of tasks, right out of the box, mm -hmm. um, and you make that available to more people, there's people yeah. are going to want to use the system more naturally, and they're going to want to uh, ultimately yeah. ta tax it out, mm -hmm. right? And so yeah. having that ability to not just scale for a data centric uh, type of use case, but also to scale out for maybe even maybe software engineers could could use uh, Dolphin Scheduler for uh, some of their, you know, integrating some of their builds uh, or testing or capabilities or things like that. Right. Like there there's more than it sounds like Dolphin Scheduler could be a much more generalized workflow orchestra or orchestrator. And when you start to tap into those uh type of use cases where it's not just about data it could even be more about software iteration and things like that um you you might you, you would definitely want to have something that can handle you know that that type of uh um scale scaling out and and being able to to deal with uh larger workloads like that so makes yeah. sense 
Um, okay, let's one last kind of thing I want to dive into on on Dolphin Scheduler um, is particularly this one that we were talking about, where you know, anytime you're doing an orchestrator, right? Like you're the orchestrator itself um, is is you know, it's great when everything's are going well and it's enforcing that this runs when this runs, and then that will run after these things runs. But then something will inevitably fail along the way, um, and I think it's really important. My, almost as, if not more important, how uh, an orchestrator deals with failure than how it's dealing with the, uh, you know, good flowing operation. And so uh, I kind of wanted to just dive in, you know, how does Dolphin Scheduler deal with failures? Like, what are the abstractions that you all include uh, when when things go wrong in uh, in these subsystems that it's uh, it's monitoring? Stay with David or... or... <laughs> Do you have a, a, any other, other ideas? Hmm. Okay, I, 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 can, I can answer this question. <laughs> sure. Actually, um, mm, um, you know, Dolphin Scheduler has uh, many master and many workers. And uh, when uh, one of them are failed, for example, uh, walkers are failed or masters are failed mm -hmm. and then, then the other um, uh, we will rebalance the whole job and uh, reduce the, the environment uh, in in the uh, for the failure walker or for, or for the failure uh, masters so uh, theoretically uh, uh, dolphin scheduler can 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 uh, i think can restore yourself uh, you needn't to do anything and the whole cluster will will work well, work well. Mm -hmm. and uh, if uh, if you, you, you if if some um, uh, fun to error happen for example uh, there will be no any any uh, there will be no any uh, there there will be no uh, if there are no uh, uh, monsters alive or no workers are alive, then there will be send an alarm by email or by some uh, alarm API to you. So okay. uh, that's uh, uh, Dolphin Scheduler uh, itself. And sometimes if your your job is failed, for example, uh, ETL job or Python job or Spark job failed, and uh, we have uh, several kinds of uh, solutions the, the the first solution is just a retry. <laughs> in each task, we have uh, retry times, and uh, you can set the retry times. For example, you are using Hive. You, you know, Hive sometimes you, you cannot you cannot uh, select something uh, very successfully because yeah. of uh, the, uh, the otherwise it would just indefinitely keep retrying, and then you would just be in a like wasting a bunch of resources and going in circles, right? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and you can say you can retry it several times, and then the text will fail. Yeah. And the second, um, when that uh, when when the task failed, uh, the the whole workflow will fail. And yeah. we have uh, some um, uh, alarm API, and uh, you can uh, you can uh, you can uh, you can receive your alarm message by email, by phone, or by Slack or buy something like that, and yeah. it's very easy to implement by our SPI. So, uh, so I think uh, that, that that's the whole story of uh, failure. <laughs> and and I, I and I look, it looks like there's also in the same way. Again, this kind of gets back to this user centricity, but like being yeah. being very like focused on uh, who gets those. Like it's a very configurable about who gets those mm -hmm. message in what case. Um, yeah. In terms of like the you you have groups of people that should get a a, a, a signal if something yeah. is successful or fails or then in, in this event and so uh, there's a lot of knobs and and uh, um, and capabilities that are baked into um, Dolphin Scheduler that enable you to essentially um, uh, customize the way those notifications and those alarms work uh, so that. The right people are getting notified when the right events happen. If that makes sense. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Cool. We have different uh, alarm alarm uh, warning groups. Yeah. You can define that. 
<laughs> yeah. And especially this is even more important when you start, you know, getting into these orchestration workflows that include people that are like not necessarily part of the data engineering teams, you might actually want to include, you know, uh, people who are building these workflows. Hey, maybe the, whoever builds a workflow, those are the people that are supposed to be notified, not the data engineers first. And then if in the event that something more cataclysmic happens, that's affecting everybody, those notifications need to go to the data engineers to fix the, the platform uh, and what's going on in there. So, so that, that, that's uh, a very, I, I thought that was a very interesting feature here of how, how the level of customizability that you have um, to, to actually um, implement not only the type of notification, um, but who and what, uh, in what, in what cases, you know, do, do these groups of people get notified? So it's very cool. Very cool. I like that, uh, that capability. And then finally on the monitoring aspect, right? If we want to, uh, understand our system better, right? Know, know thyself uh, is, is a very important piece when it comes to uh, seeing this. And because the workflow orchestrator has so many cross-cutting concerns uh, ac mm -hmm. across your entire platform, it's actually a very valuable tool to be able to monitor and see, you know, it's a, it's a kind of a good indicator of health of a system when you see that things are, are flowing well and that, you know, because ultimately you could have a lot of metrics on like, you know, your, this, the systems that, that, uh, that, um, the orchestrator is talking to, right. That, that, uh, dolphin scheduler is talking to, but if any of those systems are having problems, a lot of times those issues will, will also, you know, bubble up and show up in, in the, in the monitoring system in dolphin scheduler. So this is kind of like having a monitor to be able to look at the holistic health of your pipeline is actually a very like good bird's eye view to kind of see how, what is the health of my platform today? You know, of, of all of these pipelines that are running through uh, my system. And so um, what, what, what goes into the design here to make sure that this is also digestible to, you know, people that are, not necessarily part of the data engineering team, or or is this only for the data engineering team's eyes, right? To to see this this level of detail. Yeah. Right. Uh, yes. Uh, we want to make the uh, make the engineer uh, to know what happened uh, to their sit uh, to their dolphin scheduler sit <coughs> When you log in, you can find uh, you can find you can find the, that the status of the um, master service or worker service and the database service. Uh, you also can um, can find the uh, audit log. Uh, you can uh, see many uh, many metrics in the uh, in the Dolphin scheduler. Uh, if uh, it's especially uh, if uh, the master server die or worker uh, worker server uh, crash or die in the execution, um, you will receive an alarm uh, in time. Uh, the alarm can uh, can sent through by mail, page duty, and uh, many other um, and many other alarm tools, and. Uh, um, if the master server die uh, or crash, the other alive uh, master server will take over his uh, responsibility uh, mm -hmm. to, uh, and uh, uh, we will take the, his responsibility uh, to make the uh, workflow uh, run, run normally. So uh, we designed the monitor, uh, monitor model um, for maintainers, mm -hmm. for the uh, uh, Dolphin Scheduler uh, maintainers. Got it. Okay, so in this case, it's actually more less focused on trying to make the monitoring available to everybody. This is more trying to make sure that like the data engineering team can holistically understand the health of the system and uh, uh, and and just take a at a bird's eye glance see what's going on. Is that does that uh, what the, I because in my mind I was thinking it might be more about giving visibility as well to you know anybody who's using it, but it sounds like it's a little more specific to data engineers. 
or or uh, who whoever's running the platform. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, right. Okay. Okay. Cool. Cool. All right. Uh -huh. So um, so yeah, uh, that's that pretty much sums up like all the questions that I had around Dolphin Scheduler. Is there anything else that before we hop on to the demo? Um, is there anything else that, that, you know, any of you want to kind of cover that we didn't cover in around dolphin schedule or kind of last minute conclusion on what we should say in terms of that? Because I think we covered a pretty good amount, so you don't have to say anything here, but <laughs> if, if there's something we missed, I wanted to give you all the opportunity. Uh, um, better when, when you are using uh, data lake. I think a dolphin scheduler is a better choice. <laughs> yes, <laughs> because you have a more more task and a more workflows. <laughs> yeah, kind of what we had mentioned before, right? If you're if you're doing dealing with something that interrupts with multiple systems uh, okay. and needs. I cannot hear you. It's it's my. Uh, is oh, it wrong? Uh, can can you hear me now? Am I going out? Oh. Cole, you're here. Oh, am I okay? I don't know if uh, poss possibly uh, could be the thing. Can you can you hear me now? Okay, I'll I'll get it from Cole. Okay, so I it's, um, might be an audio issue on your end, William. Uh, if you can, uh, Cole, if you can uh, um, reply to William and let him know it might be his audio. Um, okay, so um, so yeah, so basically, uh, okay. what I was uh, going to kind of mention was. Uh, that uh let me see i kind of lost my train of thought there <laughs> give me a second to to get back uh here the for a AV second. issues derailing things is uh yeah is a storied it, trend yeah always always happens um so the basic thing oh yeah was getting back to data data lakes right so data lakes uh are interoper like usually deal with interoperable systems and with that you're going to have a kind of alphabet soup of and what I mean by alphabet soup, for no, those that don't know that that uh, uh, idiom, is there's a lot of extra uh, small individual services that are going to be running in this data lake ecosystem, and having a lot more out of the box support, having a lot more uh, capabilities to scale up the amount of of tasks that you can actually run uh, with this is going to be all the more crucial in the data lake, even over. You know, a, a much simpler, you know, smaller data warehouse uh, set of pipelines that was maybe traditional in Hadoop days or or in the kind of '90s type uh, warehouse workflow. Uh, much more today in the data lake house uh, kind of workflow, you're you're needing a lot more uh, sophisticated or orchestration. And it sounds like that's kind of where Dolphin Scheduler is trying to aim to to, to handle those use cases. So great. Um, well, that's really cool sum summarization. Uh, William, can you hear me now? Are we? Are we? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, good. Okay. <laughs> okay. Great. Great. Um, so yeah. So uh, that sounds pretty good. Uh, I'm. I'm gonna like. Let's say. Let's hop over to demo. Uh, so that we have uh, some time for that, and then uh, and then we're gonna run into the PR of the episode. So uh, if without no further ado, uh, to the demo of the episode. <laughs> Okay, so uh, Jay, whenever you're ready, uh, oh, it looks like you're, let me see, did I, there it is. I will pull it up here. So um, so just to give everybody a, a, a bit of a background, um, the the instructions for how to do this, actually, let me, let me show my screen one more time real fast. Uh, in the show notes here, we have the demo of the episodes. And if you go to the link that's set down here, uh, there's a README on how to set up all of the uh, the uh, the infrastructure that Jay is about to show you. Um, you you it's all exists in our um, this repository here under Dolphin Scheduler, and you just go through the README and uh, follow the instructions there. Uh, this is basically after you've already started the services, and now off to you, uh, Jay. So you've you've already started the services um, sitting on top of Docker, and you're showing us the Dolphin Scheduler uh, user interface, correct? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Great. And you can see the this is the Dolphin Scheduler login page. When we enter the username and password, oh, that's the wrong password. Sorry. 
So in, you, the, in, in this one, it's dolphin, the, dolphin Scheduler 1, 2, 3 that you have on the readme here. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. Cool. And the first page you enter the Dolphin Scheduler was the home page. It will show you the basic statistic information about Dolphin Scheduler, like how many workflow you have and how many tasks uh, today runs and how many workflows today runs and what's the state of the each workflow and task, such as we have the the, fa the failure and the success, the success uh, workflow. And when you're using the Dolphin Scheduler, the first thing you should know and remember is what is the concept of the Dolphin Scheduler talent. Uh, in Dolphin Scheduler, there, the, the concept of user and talent will sometimes will mislead in some users. And the brief difference is the talent is for the task runs. It, it means the when the task run, the uh, Dolphin Scheduler will use the talent to run the task. And the user is only for the web server and web UI. Yeah. Is would it would it be fair to say that tenants work like groups, kind of like you know? So if you're in a group that you want to, um, you know, that that are in a that have a certain set of resources allotted to them, uh, the tenant is more focused on the resources that, let's say, yes. a group of people have, and then yes, there's yes. okay, okay, great, yes, and the tenant is one 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 to one relationship into the into your Linux box to run the Dolphin Scheduler worker. So uh, when you create a U tenant name root and it will create your create a Linux user in your Linux box name tenant yeah. name root and and there are an other concept to to know about users and tenant. Uh, users and tenant are one-to-one -one relations, so mm. we can assign uh, a tenant to single users. Uh, in this example, I sign a root tenant to uh, user <laughs> admin, and this means when we log in to Dolphin Scheduler Web UI, we can create and manage our workflow by user admin. But when we run the workflow and or we run the task, we will use the the tenant name root to run the task. Yeah. And and that's uh, that is I I want to say the the the, the, the basic difference, the basic contact contact when you use the Dolphin scheduler. Hmm. And let's begin to create a workflow in Dolphin Scheduler. In Dolphin Scheduler, each workflow belongs to project. So when we want to create a workflow, we have to create a project. Uh, in, this, in this case, we name the new project one because we already have the new project. So we create a new project one and all the workflow should connect in to this project. And when we go to the project dialog, we can see there's a there's a simple statistic for this project. And we can see how many tasks uh task instance it has and how many workflow instance project have. Yes. And if you want to create a workflow, we can go to the workflow definition dialog. Yeah. You can simple click the create workflow button to create a workflow. Just, just, just Dolphin Scheduler said, we use drag and draw first to create our workflow. You can simply click the workflow and draw to the canvas to create a task. Uh, our task has some mass form data form. To, uh, we require data for, for example, you can create a name like equal one and you just equal one, run the equal one batch command. 
and then you can save it into the you can save it and name our workflow such as we name it like workflow uh, and that's it we, we just create a workflow with one single task and the workflow name workflow and the task name equal one it just equal it just run the command equal one and simply print the one in our terminal hmm. when you want to run the workflow we have to up set the workflow online because we can make sure that all the running workflow is online to uh, to, to make sure the, 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 the security of the when you develop the workflow yeah and we just simply click the start button to start our workflow and you can see it, it, it already create a workflow instance for the workflow definition and when we go to the workflow instance dialog we can see it was the the state of the this task is success and we can see the log of this task and it's it just simple print the one in our in our log yeah and that's the simple uh, way to so create the, j yeah j yeah. j I, uh, I i we're still only seeing the workflow definition at this point or was it was there another window that you were working off of Oh, no, no. Uh, we when the workflow run, we will create the workflow instance, uh, as you can see. Jay, Jay that, you, we 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 didn't see we <laughs> your see screen is, is freeze. <laughs> oh yes. Oh, I, we can still see. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Oh, oh my God. So I, you had you had just created the workflow. If you want to start from there. Oh, I, 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 I will share my screen now. Okay. Maybe yeah. That, yeah. 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 No worries. And I'll bring, I'll bring it back. Uh, let me see. So, and then no worries. Like, you know, this is, this is why demos are fun, right? Is because uh, they can, uh, they can go like this. So, uh, so let me see if, uh, can you, yeah, we, I see your mouse moving now. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we can see the, 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 the instant, the instant of Waffle is great. Yeah. It's just same as the workflow definition line. But Would you mind uh, going to the workflow definition and show us how you run it yeah. one more time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, before we before we run the workflow, we have to set it online. Yeah, and then we can okay. simply click the start button to run our workflow. Oh, great! And yeah. that's just to protect you if, like, you're not want you don't intend to run a certain workflow that you can put it all into an offline mode to avoid somebody accidentally starting it. Yes, yes. That's okay, correct. great. And then you can see there's two workflow instance here, and both of them are success. Hmm. Yeah, and, 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 and we can see. Oh, oh, I know that because when I click the because when I click the workflow instance, it, it will create a new tag for the Chrome. I'm sure and everyone can uh, imagine the output of the workflow being yeah, being one. one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. We we can imagine that one. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And okay, that's a simple way to run the workflow in the Dolphin scheduler. Okay. Yeah, and for the Chino, Chino is a you know, channel for for Dolphin scheduler is the circle task. We have the circle task here. So so when we want to use channel, we 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 have to uh create a uh, create the data source for channel first. Okay. And if and if you follow the the tutorial, we just merge into the getting start channel getting start repository. You can you can start a channel uh follow, follow the step hmm. and and when you want to connect channel in dolphin schedule you have to choose channel data source yeah you you have to fill some uh required data for data for uh just like we, we, we have to enter the uh maybe the the channel uh path and the IP maybe is the 
one, two, one, two, zero. And we can simply run the task to test the, oh, sorry. We can simply run the task to test the, to test whether the, oh, test whether the uh, data store is available. And because I already created a channel, channel report, channel data source, so, so I, I, I just cancel the, the, the query process. And, and when you and when all sets of your data source, you can use it in the in the in the workflow in the workflow. Yes, mm -hmm. in the workflow. Yeah, be, because the topic scheduler was was just create a new test, so so I have to change a uh, to, to 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 another tag. So, so sorry. Sure. Yeah. No worries. Yeah, so no sorry. worries. <laughs> we'll pull it up. Let's see. Oh, so yeah. I, no I rush. Know. People, people can skip forward through this whenever uh, this is on YouTube. So no worries. <laughs> yeah, you are so kind, Brian. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Be because we already create the create create the create the create the workflow. Oh. Uh, 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 Again, <laughs> no, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so sorry about that. <laughs> uh, because topic scheduler will will create a new tab for it. It will be more convenient to when you add the multiple workflow. Yeah, okay. yeah. We can simple. We can simply drive the circle task into the workflow dialog and rename it to channel, and we select the channel data source and set the uh, data source instant, and sometimes maybe we, we we just put some, you know, put some. You select one. <laughs> yeah, put, put some select. Oh, oh there you go. Select, oh, yeah, put some select to 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 it. Oh, maybe this cannot work. Uh, I can I, I can I can make some. I can copy some from the tutorial. Uh, yeah, this way. perfect. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh here, here I can grab it. Yeah, it, it, it's just uh select s s select some customer table, and then we can save the workflow again and set it online again and run it. Yeah, that that's that, that's that's all. And we can uh, we can start the uh you 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 can see that we already. The state of the workflow instance is success and we can query the the channel data source. Perfect. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And very, very cool. That's all. That's all. Yeah, that's great. Awesome. All right. Well, well, thank you very much for that, Jay. I think, you know, uh it's it's always uh very good like for people to, you know. See, and I, I wanted to, actually, Jay, could you pull that up one more time now that I think about it? I wanted to, could you bring up your screen one more time? Because I also yeah. want to show all the other sources that you all have. So uh, I think the, the powerful aspect here, um, here, I'll bring this up here. Uh, could you open up a, a workflow, uh, the, the workflow definition where it shows all of the potential data sources? Oh, data source. Yeah, oh, yeah, we, yeah, there you go, new data source. Or not, not not necessarily data source, but the, the what was it the, the task type? That's what I meant to say. The task, yeah. <laughs> the yeah. Task. If you the open task. up where the, the if you go to workflow and then workflow. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Uh -oh. If you bring that up, I wanted to show the uh, the variety of of uh, tasks that you all are uh, uh, capable of doing in the kind of drag and drop there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I will show the task. So I think the really powerful thing, you know, if you look at to this left screen right here, this left pane, uh, these are, you know, you have shell here, Java, Python, procedural, uh, SQL, like, and then, you know, that's the universal ones. If you go and look in cloud, you actually, can you open up the cloud one there? Yeah, yeah, of course. You have ability to, you know, interface with Kubernetes. You have ability to interface with EMR. And so these, these are just kind of the same way that, that Trino works, all these different kind of plugins and connectors that you can now uh, set up in a certain way, in a templated way, and then give to end users to drag and drop and pull these things together. 
Um, I think that user experience is a really big thing, as well as the experience that uh, that William was mentioning before, where it's this, you know, very able to scale to multi-tenant tenancy uh, that makes Dolphin Schedule pre- Dolphin Scheduler pretty interesting in, in my opinion. So, so that's the kind of power that you can interweave a lot of these uh, these out of the box solutions and capabilities. I don't know, spin up Kubernetes if you need to somewhere in between there, and then you know, query that new task. Like there's a lot of, uh, uh, of options here that, that become, uh, um, capable of uh, that go outside of what we normally defined or previously defined as a, as an orchestrator. So that's, that's, I think another really cool, uh, element of dolphin scheduler that I didn't want to get undersold with this demo of, you know, just showing just Trino, um, the, the interweaving of Trino into these other tasks are, are, uh, I think what makes it very powerful. Um, so, yeah, very, yeah, very cool. Show the, the machine learning task. <laughs> so it's yeah, we also, oh, yeah. we also introduced the machine learning <laughs> task in the latest <coughs> latest version. Yeah. Oh, cool. So SageMaker, if you're doing AWS, uh, PyTorch, yeah. you all have Ray in there by chance, or is Ray coming anytime soon? I know, I know, a lot of our our uh, Trino users use Ray. Yeah, we we, we will have a meetup with Ray. <laughs> Oh, I cool! Think next month, and we will have that task. Awesome. The time. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, this this gets right into like the crux of of what a lot of people are trying to do with Trino nowadays as well: machine learning and uh, AI and ML tasks, right? So, uh, very good point, William, to bring up there, and thanks for showing that, Jay. Um, so, and, yeah. And so Jay, you can you can create uh, sorry to interrupt. Jay, you you can just uh, uh, show how to create a dependency between two tasks. Yeah, yeah. Let's just yeah. just to show what that looks like. <laughs> you two tasks, you two, from Echo to Trino, you can link how to create a dependency between Echo Echo okay, One okay. and a Trino. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I got it. I got it. But I have to uh, set it up, set it down low. Yeah. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. The, okay. The dip, the setting the difference, setting the dependency between the tasks is quite simple. You can just Click the upstream task and drag it to the downstream task, and nice. then you release your mouse, and the relationship will be created. And nice. when you click the save button, you all the information, including the task and the task dependency, will be saved in Dolphin Scheduler Mentor data, and the workflow will be created. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. And yeah, anytime I think it's you run... very simple. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that's, uh, and, and so I, I would say this user interface is very keen. What it reminds me of is uh, NiFi. If anybody's ever worked with NiFi uh, before as well. I, I know. <laughs> so uh, it, had, it had this similar kind of like drag and drop thing. And I thought that's one of the, I think the, biggest draws about NiFi, but it wasn't as generalizable and did not have the data focus that, uh, that, that, uh, uh, dolphin scheduler has as well as the also generalized focus to make it more, uh, applicable to, um, software engineers or data analysts outside of your, your team. So this is all really, really cool. I'm, I'm, I think it's, uh, uh, interesting. And I hope that, uh, you know, more people as they come up with questions around dolphin scheduler, uh, I'll, I'll have all of you uh, are in the Trino uh, Slack channel, so you'll be able to answer all, uh, any questions that we get from there. So very, very cool. Thanks for that that demo, Jay. Um, and uh, yeah, let's let's uh, let me see. Let me get back into gears with uh, our final uh, uh, section uh, segment of the show, which is the. Uh, PR. Uh oh, I wasn't ready for this. Hold on, let me second. Okay, so ready for the, the PR of the episode. <laughs> there it is. There it is. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so while we've been talking about data lakes and all this other stuff, um, you know, this this is uh, kind of getting away from all the cool stuff we've learned about today with Dolphin Scheduler. Um, I want to talk about. Uh, you know, one of these, we were talking about performance uh, releases and, th- and things like that earlier in the, re- the last releases. Um, and one of the uh, first things that Trino has, you know, did in the earlier days was like, they, they, we, I guess we really put our bets, hedged our bets and, and focused on ORC 
format uh, a lot in the earlier days of Trino. Um, more recently, there have been a lot of uh, parquet improvements coming down the line. And when we're, what we're starting to see is parquet is primarily the uh, get, gaining, I guess, a lot more popularity in data science and, and machine learning uh, communities. And, uh, and so that is kind of becoming the more de facto standard outside of, uh, you know, just kind of uh, data engineering teams, I would say. And so, uh, so we really do want to start putting this, this like larger investment into Parquet. And um, I wanted to showcase a couple of these performance improvements uh, that, that came around uh, our, specifically our Parquet files. Um, Renak Mororka, uh, he's a maintainer and uh, also just contributor, long, long time contributor. We had him on, I think, episode like uh, 11 where he, he had implemented some, some of these performance benefits around dynamic filtering when he worked at uh, Kubel. Um, he is now currently working at Starburst with all of us. So, um, so anyways, uh, he, he did a lot of work on the Parquet files. Uh, so I, I linked multiple of these, um, these um, uh, PRs. Uh, so it's actually a multiple PR of the episode, but they all are kind of covering very, very similar uh, overlaps of basically just, you know, uh, rescale decimals, uh, optimizing the parquet reader, uh, essentially just trying to improve the, the read performance out of these. And again, these are one of those like uh, individually, it's a very small uh, kind of uh, change, but then uh, you add in the fact that we've, we've covered all of these timestamps across uh, one file format and you do this you know, on multiple times on, on kind of perform, uh, improving the performance where, really getting to the point now where there's not much as much of a distinction uh, between the orc performance that there was of the parquet performance. Um, and so that's been really something we've been intentional about just due to the fact that parquet is really uh, a very central uh, file, open file format that people are using around machine learning and, and data science. So we want to make sure that that is a uh, very fast uh, uh, standpoint. Yeah. And, and this has been this has been happening every release. I think it's probably the most common release note I've had in the last four months has been per make parquet better parquet performance <laughs> in some variety. It's yeah. every time it's it's Ronak like just making parquet better, adding like new configuration options, yeah. adding marginal performance improvements, and they have to be piling up. So yeah. Yeah. So at this point, uh, you know, when we look at benchmarks uh, that, that have happened, you know, over, over the time, like there is, used to be kind of a gap between parquet performance and orc. And that gap has been, you know, getting much, much closer. Uh, our orc performance have, has always been top, top tier. Parquet has gotten better here and there. But then it was just like we in the last year, it's really gotten because like we've really closed the race there, uh, particularly due to the, the popularity of, of Parquet and in these uh, other workloads. And so um, so, yeah, so definitely if you're a very heavy Parquet user, uh, I wanted to point that out and, and get the excitement going on around that. Um, let's see. So uh, let me pull in uh, everybody here. So basically, uh, in, in summary, uh, I wanted to say, you know, Dolphin Scheduler has a lot of interesting features, um, you know, in, in contrast to previous orchestrators uh, that I think make it very much worth checking out. It's very scalable. Uh, it has a lot more, again, like this kind of user focus that I really enjoy in terms of the user experience that expands outside of just the data engineering team and feeds into this kind of goal that we're trying to uh, achieve in data where it's like self -serve, much more self-service, right? Uh, and that, that to me is very exciting to, to see a project like this, you know, finally have a, an orchestrator that, that does have that, that those capabilities. So, uh, I wanted to quickly thank, you know, all of you for joining me. It's now, I think, what is it? 3 AM in China right now. Yeah. So you guys need to go, go get some sleep. Uh, anything that, you know, so, so where, where do people go if they want to learn about Dolphin Scheduler and about what you all are doing, what the latest features are? Uh, I think uh, right now is we call the ops, you, you know, data ops. Okay. <laughs> then we just do some uh, features of uh, data ops uh, on uh, Dolphin Scheduler. Okay. And uh, then everybody can use Dolphin Scheduler and uh, to use GitHub or GitLab very, very easily. 
by okay. using deltas together and it can bind them together. <laughs> okay, great. So this is, you know, if you're wanting to check out the website too, uh, it's dolphin scheduler, all, all one word there, uh, dot apache.org. It's a, it is an Apache uh, uh, project. Uh, you can get to start feeling this. And I think now this is 40 plus types. You guys got to fix your website. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. So, uh, and I don't know if it was Trino the 40th, <laughs> maybe, um, <laughs> But anyways, uh, so, and, and yeah, we should get a, we should get a Trino, uh, logo in here. I didn't know if I saw the Trino yeah, one in here yet. Um, but, uh, yeah. And then, uh, you know, checking out all the different features, high reliability features, all the things that we talked about today, um, obviously links to their GitHub, uh, that, that, uh, you know, will give you a lot of uh, ability to check into the code if you're wanting to contribute. Um, and then, uh, they also have a Slack channel, much like Trino to, uh, to join and, and be a part of that. So all of that is available. Uh, if you go to the community drop down here, um, and, and go onto this space, uh, you can, you can check this out and I'll add all of those links into the show notes. Um, anything else, any of y'all want to add before we, we hop off for today and let you all get some sleep. All right. I'll take that as let's get some sleep. So thank you all very much for joining and uh, we'll see you all in the next uh, Trina Community Broadcast in uh, next month. Thanks. Music for the Bye. show is from Bye. the Mega Man 6 gameplay album by Shishtof Swabikowski. Don't forget to give us a star on the Trino repository at github.com forward slash TrinoDB forward slash Trino. And for more information on future shows and to find show notes, check out trino.io forward slash broadcast.